all done. Ah, a big thank you, Mr. Holmes. Think nothing of it, my friend. So, the reports. Why don't you wait till the inspectors get back? You would certainly learn more. If I wanted to meet the inspectors, I would have done so. So, give me the preliminary reports, and above all, do not mention my visit to anyone. Is that clear? Sure, if that's what you want. Here are the reports. Thank you. Have you obtained the preliminary reports? Yes, we'll read them on the go. Let's to the scene of the crime at Bucks Row, Watson. What are all these people doing here, Holmes? Apparently they came to see the scene of the crime. What about us? Aren't we going to see it? We will return this evening, Watson. The circumstances should be ideal for carrying out our little experiments. Well, Watson, we are at the scene of the Polly Nichols murder. Imagine the victim lying at the spot where she was found and try to discern all of the clues we can. Watson, you are a writer. I am therefore entrusting you with our deduction board. It will help us to establish certain facts. Understood, Holmes. Let's look at this poor woman more closely. There's a bruise on the left cheek. The tongue is swollen. There is a bruise at the level of the right maxilla. The throat was slit from left to right. There are two incisions. A small pool of blood, six inches in diameter. The throat was slit from left to right. No signs of blood. No marks on the ground. The ground is muddy. No marks on the ground. The ground is muddy. The body was lying on its back, legs straight and slightly apart. The skirt had been lifted up to the middle of the body. The left hand was touching the barn door. The body was still warm. Let's reread the preliminary report for the details on the wounds inflicted upon this poor woman. The body was still warm. There is a black bonnet near the left hand. The body was still warm. What are we doing, Holmes?
What do you think, Holmes? This spot is deserted, Holmes. The prostitutes only come here to exercise. This spot is deserted, Holmes. to go that way. The body was still warm. No marks on the ground. The ground is muddy. There is only one street light lit on this street, Watson, and this spot is particularly poorly lit. Well, Watson, we have found all of the possible clues, I think. Uh, we will now attempt to recreate the scene of the murder. Come closer, Watson. I have to make you up. You are joking, Holmes? I feel ridiculous, Holmes. Now, Watson, come and stand here in front of me. You shall play the role of the poor woman and I shall play that of the murderer. Let's try to reconstruct the facts to ensure the final result corresponds indisputably to the way that Polly Nichols was killed. This position is unlikely. The murderer had enough room to inflict the wounds to the neck and these wounds suggest the left hand was used. had enough room to inflict the wounds to the neck and these wounds suggest the left no i don't think that things went like that the murderer didn't attempt to st If the killer positioned himself to the side of the victim to slit her throat, regardless of which hand he used, he would have risked seeing the blood flow uncontrolled. I hope that, as with the real murder, nobody had to witness all of that, Watson. If the murderer used his right hand to stride his victim, there wasn't much room. The murderer had enough room to inflict the wounds to the neck and these wounds suggest the left hand was used. No, I don't think that thing... The murderer had enough room...
Sorry, Watson. No, the victim wasn't already lying down on the ground before dying. No, had the victim had her throat slit while... This position is unlikely. Sorry, Watson. No, the victim wasn't already lying down on the ground before dying. This position is unlikely. The murderer had enough room to inflict the wounds to the neck and these wounds suggest the left hand was used. The murderer had enough room to inflict the wounds to the neck and these wounds suggest the left hand was used. The murderer had enough room to inflict the wounds to the neck and these wounds suggest the left hand The murderer had enough room to inflict the wounds to the neck and these wounds suggest the left hand was used. Yes, it's quite possible the events occurred like this. My dear Watson, now that we have found all of our clues, nothing remains but to subject them to our most likely hypotheses in order to deduce the facts.
victim was most probably dead before being laid down. Once the heart stopped, gravity drained the body slowly, not in a heavy spurt that would have stained half the street. Thank you, Holmes. I understand why you told me not to change clothes. Do you realize that our behavior didn't alarm anyone? The victim's ordeal was even more discreet. By acting in silence, we have confirmed something. The crime definitely took place here. The victim and her murderer were able to come here without making any noise, and afterwards the murder took place without the slightest cry being uttered. Come, Watson, let's go home. We have spent far too long in this sinister alley. And so, my dear Watson, the day and night which we passed in Whitechapel were enlightening, weren't they? An adventure that I most certainly will never relate, to be in the skin of that poor woman. I prefer not to speak of it further. But have we really learned anything about the murderer? Obviously a man, given the necessary strength. We have little to go on, at least no more than the police. But in my opinion, Inspector Abeline has a trick or two up his sleeve. No, I want to talk about the facts and what we can draw from them. We know where the crime was committed and under what conditions. I would like to ask you about the possible motives for the crime. According to you, Watson, what could have pushed the murderer to act in such a way? A personal drama. Love can certainly lead to many a drama, but we have to consider the fact that the victim didn't know her attacker. Revenge, Holmes? Revenge could be a possible motive, but with one small reservation. We have reason to believe that the victim considered her murderer to be a typical client. Black magic? I'm not terribly interested in the occult or black magic. Let's give the benefit of the doubt to this motive. Homicidal insanity, Holmes. It is indubitable that the man who did this to Polly Nichols is not of his full senses. Mm. Theft, perhaps. I have a hard time believing that someone would attack poor Polly so fiercely just to rob her of a few coins. Well, we are still missing certain information in order to finish this investigation, Watson. What are we doing, Holmes? Elementary. Very well, Watson. I think that we've exhausted the topic. Take a rest and we'll speak again later. Ah, it would seem that the investigation is advancing, Holmes. Yesterday's star said that a suspect is in the hands of the police, a man with a rather sinister reputation. I was about to join you in your optimistic outlook until you informed me that the good news came from the press, Watson. 
But surely they wouldn't invent the fact that the police are holding a suspect or the acts that are attributed to him. You will have an exact answer to these two questions in less than 50 seconds, Watson. Pardon? Enter, Inspector. Good day. Dear Watson, allow me to introduce Inspector Aberline. Inspector, Dr. Watson. Inspector? To what do we owe the honour of your presence, Inspector? I heard that the two of you made your way to Whitechapel a few days ago. Your arrival, you are aware, coincides with a very serious affair which our police service is going to great lengths to solve and which is creating strong tensions in the area. Pardon me, but haven't you arrested someone? A certain leather apron? Absolutely not. The man who hides behind this name is indeed being actively searched for by the force. Besides, nothing at the moment suggests that he is the Bucks Row murderer. There, you've been enlightened, Watson. Now it is our turn to answer Inspector Aberline's questions. Indeed. I will be brief and precise. Do you intend to investigate this case, or have you already started? It is to be of service to a friend that I went to Whitechapel. We did, out of curiosity, familiarise ourselves with the preliminary reports, and we made our way to the scene of the crime. Our conclusions are slim, as are the clues. Having not been officially appointed by a client, I believe that my intervention in this business will end there. Very well. To be frank, you take the weight off my shoulders by distancing yourself from the case. Our image isn't very good, to say nothing of what the press puts us through. Thus, if overnight they found out that you were on the case, people would turn against us. And they would pester me, overwhelm me, and finally make me out to be responsible for the inevitable failure such a scenario entails. Neither you nor I wish for this to happen. I know that your time is precious, Inspector. I will send you a note regarding my conclusions shortly. With pleasure. Gentlemen? Do you think that he will find the murderer? The chances are slim to non-existent. It is seven days now, short of a confession from the murderer himself. And you will not go further? You heard the Inspector Watson. My presence in Whitechapel would hinder, which doesn't mean that we will drop the case. How is that? The Inspector spoke of me, but not of us. It is you, Watson, who will lead the investigation tonight. It is you who will bring to the police station the little note that I will write regarding our conclusions. Despite the late hour, there is nothing to stop you from making inquiries about this famous leather apron while you are there. Well, if I follow Holmes' instructions, then to begin my investigation into this leather apron, I must first head to the police station. Good evening, sir. What do you... I know you. You were here last week with Sherlock Holmes. Indeed. I have come to bring a message from Sherlock Holmes for Inspector Aberline. Very well, I will pass it on. But come to think of it, someone was asking about you recently. Fiddly, the caretaker of some shady boarding house nearby. Does that mean anything to you? Ah, perhaps. Actually, I read in the Star that you have arrested a suspect called Leather Apron. You shouldn't believe what you read in that rag, sir. The man is being hunted, but we have yet to get our hands on him, and we aren't close to it either. Why ever not? 
Bah, he's a specialist in the streetwalker racket. These girls make pitiful witnesses, and we don't inspire confidence. Furthermore, the man seems to be pretty discreet lately. Someone must be helping to hide him. How to get on his trail, then? One of these girls would have to confide in us and give a valid description of the man. Then we'd ask around the journeymen, who use aprons, I imagine. Well, goodbye. I must go to Finley's boarding house. Good evening, Finley. Oh, good evening, sir. Aren't you the gentleman who was but the great detective the other time? That is indeed me, Dr. Watson. Tell me, Finlay, I was told that you were looking for us at the police station. Indeed, I wanted to thank you for last time, you know. That vagrant has never set foot round mine again. I even found a tenant, one who pays his rent, I mean. You don't seem very happy, but you were lucky to have found a good tenant so quickly. It's just that this man is very strange. He paid several days in advance and I gave him a key to the place. Since then he goes out every night and returns at ungodly hours. I'm sure he goes to visit the ladies, but still, every night. And when he moved in, something must have broken in his case and stank up the stairs in his room for two days. I think it was a jar. It must be over there. Tell me, have you heard talk of Leather Apron? By the papers, that's all. This man seems very sinister. Do you know any journeymen who use this type of apron? The slaughterhouse butchers, I believe, but definitely the cobblers. I know one, old Isaac Solomonovich. His workshop is on a small street in the Jewish community, across from the hospital. He's a good man. He can help you. But you know, the people there are very close and don't share much with non-Jews. Thank you, Finley. At your service, sir. Hmm, this odour is very strong indeed. But the whole neighbourhood as such has a dreadful stench. Finley might have an idea as to what this bottle contained. What do you want, Doctor? You're right, the pieces of the jar that your tenant broke do give off a strange smell. It's true. That's quite normal given his trade. Yes, and what would the trade be of your strange tenant? A doctor, like yourself, I believe. Dr. Tumblety, a foreigner. Canadian, perhaps. Dr. Tumblety. It might be interesting to know more about him. Thank you, Finley. At your service, sir. A cobbler shop. Hmm. Closed. I will return later. The policeman said the street girls would know something about the leather apron. Maybe I should go and see Lucy.
it's you. I'm coming. Dr. Watson, how are you? Well, and yourself? And how's your uncle? Oh, he sleeps a lot, but he doesn't seem to be suffering. Your medicine has worked wonders. Thank you again. It was the least I could do. I have come to see you about a certain leather apron. Have you heard of him? Oh, yes, of course. Terrible things are said about that man. Have you ever come across him? Goodness gracious, no. But I know that he has threatened and taken many girls in uh, my situation. I don't know what more I can say, but um, Bella would be able to tell you some. Who is Bella? Bella Pullman. She's the landlady of the place where I... Uh, I could take you there if you like. Please do. It's me. It's Lucy. This gentleman would like to speak to Bella. It's the doctor who helped me. I must leave to return to my uncle. Thanks again. Out of the way, I don't like the look of you. If you'd be patient, Madam Bella will arrive in a moment. Good evening, I am Dr Watson. It is young Lucy who told me to come see you. So you're the good Samaritan who saved her uncle without asking for anything in return. And now you've come to see me, no doubt, to explain that the poor little thing doesn't belong here and you will see to her future. Well, if you expect me to let her leave with you. <laughs> it's not that, ma'am. Uh, you should know I am a married man. And why should that matter? I believe there has been a misunderstanding. The reason that Lucy sent me here is that you may be able to give me some information about Leather Apron. Are you a doctor or a constable? I am most certainly a doctor, but I am acting in this matter in a private capacity, and I would like to find this man. Well, if you're able to rid us of him, I'll give you a week's worth of free passes. That man is a thorn in our sides. He spies on the girls in the streets and watches them inside the houses, spying through the windows. And as soon as they're finished with a client, he jumps on them without any warning and forces them to give him their money. I've never seen him, but one of my girls was attacked by this man and she said that he wore a leather apron and carried a knife. And his face, oh, he has a horrible head with rat's eyes and a deformed mouth. She even said that she knew his name, um, Pizer or Pizer, I think. But I don't know where she can be found. Margie Nutcracker, the girl I'm talking about, could tell you more, but I had to let her go last week. Why did you let Margie go? The poor girl caught a shameful sickness, and the symptoms have attacked her face, if you know what I mean. So I gave her notice, and a little bit to help her along. I don't know where she is now, but she'll certainly be getting treatment at the clinic if she's still in the neighbourhood. Did you speak to the police? <sighs> what would they do? Who cares about the girls in the streets? Would you have received a visit from another doctor, a stranger by the name of Tumblety? I'm just like you, Doctor. Sworn to secrecy in my profession. But as I've taken a fancy to you, I can tell you that this name is not unknown to me. And if you do me a little favour, it is possible I might remember something about him. Ahem. Uh, what kind of favour must I do for you? You see that man over there? He's a rich artist, a painter, a regular client round here. Well, yesterday, he came and left his cane in the umbrella stand in the hall before going into one of the rooms. Well, when he returned to this room, the cane had disappeared. It's a cane with a massive silver knob. It must be worth a fortune. He threatened to call the police unless he got free services in my establishment for a year. I'll be forced to accept, unwillingly, of course, given the services that he's demanding, unless the cane is found. 
Did you question the residents regarding the theft? They didn't see anything, and there's not one of them that would risk stealing from a client here. Who was in the room when your weasel of a client was in the chambers? There were a few that came and went, but Mary could tell you better than I can, cos she was the one at the counter yesterday. Thank you, ma'am. No problem, my angel. What happened to this rug? Oh, it was when we got a coal yesterday. I asked the young man to fill the pail. He came back to put it down, but his feet were covered in soot and he made a black print. Madame Bella said it was my fault and I got a shilling's penalty. I also have to clean the print and it's no picnic. He has immense feet, that boy. I heard that there was a theft yesterday. Did you see anything? No, and I was here the whole time. Who delivers the coal? It's never the same person. I've never seen that lad before. Do you always keep an eye on the coat stand? Oh, yes. Well, when the coal delivery came, a client came out of the chambers and stopped me from seeing the boy who brought the bucket of coal. You don't think he would have taken advantage? Until next time, miss. With pleasure, sir. <laughs> Best not to stray off in that direction. Tell me, is it? What are you looking for? Tricks, opium, girl, same. Tell me, is it? This area is shameful, don't you think? Tell me, is it? Out of the way, I don't like the look of you. Good evening, Doctor. My name is Dr. Watson. Pleased to meet you. Good evening. I am Dr. Gibbons. Likewise. I have come to see you about one of your patients. Margie goes by the nickname Nutcracker, who gets her prescription from the clinic. She's a lady of the night and is afflicted with a venereal disease. I know who you're talking about. Indeed, Margie has syphilis and is being treated with mercury. Do you have her address? No, and for your information, she left London for good three days ago. She felt threatened. Margie felt threatened? But by who? I believe that Margie was particularly scared of a terrifying man who attacked her once. Did she say the name Pizer or Pytha? Unfortunately, she didn't give a name, but she described a man with shifty, rat-like eyes and a mouth twisted in a sinister grimace. Did Margie have any idea where this man who terrified her so much might be found? No, but she told me that another girl who'd been attacked like her had told her that this man worked in a cobbler's run by an old Israelite. Also, she saw him again last week, the night of the big fire. 
She told of going to see the fire like most everyone else in the area. While there, she recognised her attacker in the crowds gathered at the warehouses. There was no mistake in a face like that, she said. She kept an eye on the man the whole time the firemen were working in order to avoid him. Goodbye, Dr Gibbons. Until we meet again, my dear colleague. This interview with the doctor revealed an important fact. Leather Apron could not be the Bucks Row murderer. According to Margie, the villain passed most of the night of the crime at the fire. He could not have been at the scene of the murder at the moment it was committed. He is nonetheless a dangerous character. Hmm, closed. What do you want, Doctor? Thank you, Finley. At your service. 